probably have some new people online, but it's really hard to tell. <laughs> Hold on, she's recording and I got to say I got it. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to be introducing Brandy Dunn, who's sitting here right next to me. And I have been lucky enough to work with her on a couple different adventures over at the Conservation District. We both got our chainsaw certification together. <laughs> so <laughs> um, Brandy began her adventures with becoming um, in with bee identification and monitoring, I believe through the Conservation District. Um, did you start on one of those bio blitz, bee bio blitzes? I think I did. Yeah. Uh, that's how I started yeah. too. Only I'm not anywhere near as good. I can tell a carpenter bee. Okay, and then she is the volunteer site steward for the Dutch, uh, the steward for the Boone Creek Conservation Area, which is over here up in on the north end of Bull Valley. And she's also been working with seed collecting and enrichment program with the conservation district and in other places too. And she also is an herbicide applicator. So that is the second higher level of herbicide use. She knows her stuff. And in 2022, she became a Wisconsin mas master naturalist. And she is currently working on her Illinois master naturalist certification through a brand new program that they just started in Illinois. So she's helping with that. And she's on the board of directors for the Boone and Dutch Creek Alliance and where they work on ed restoration, education, wise land use in the, Bull, in the Boone Creek, Bull Valley, McHenry area. So I've worked with her on cleanups along Boone Creek too. And she is currently an Xerxes ambassador for the Great Lakes region with Carol. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Carol has, I've seen Carol speak too. So Brandy gets to do it this time. <laughs> so welcome to join us here. Where is the clip? Is the clip missing or is this the clip? Okay. I was going to say she's going to have a real hard time clipping this on if the clip isn't mm -hmm. on it. There. Wherever yeah. You we want it right there is good there that works You're okay <laughs> well thank you so much i'm really pleased to be here this is a wonderful uh, uh gathering and a tradition that you've been carrying on for 14 years now i feel very fortunate to be a part of that and we'll see how this advances because sometimes in the beginning of these things we have trouble with advancing slides so this one's not wanting to and we didn't try that. It it worked earlier. <laughs> what is it? What do we have to do? Reshare the uh, slide points, the thing on the slide mm -hmm. like this. Thing. Yeah, I've seen that happen it's on other up. meetings before, and then it freezes and it doesn't want to advance. And I'm still learning all the bells and whistles. <laughs> Can you close it out? Oh, it, it, it did advance. Okay. <laughs> we can see that. Well, you know, today you know, we're, we're going to be talking about cherishing bum, uh, native bees, cherishing our native bees, but it happens to be my wedding anniversary. And this is my husband right here. So I kind of have to, you know, if you think about loving, honoring, and cherishing, we, we took those vows, and it just seems very appropriate to be talking about bumblebees. But he really has been uh, very supportive, um, be above and beyond. And he has followed me around chasing bees and not complained too much about it. <laughs> they, they say that uh, love is the bread. Uh, it kind of, that, this kind of hiding, let me move this. You can probably... Can can I? How do I do that? <laughs> My tech. So sorry. Yes, there we go. Because <laughs> that'll that'll help put it down there. Sure. Love is the bread of marriage, uh, with sacrifice, service, loyalty, and commitment. But cherishing is the jam. It's the sweet spot. You know, the honey spot. It's what makes uh, marriage delicious, or the bread delicious, and. I appreciate that uh, I've had a sweet 26 years with this guy here. <laughs> and please advance, it's not advancing. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't like, I hate when technical. We're very informal. We're patient. <laughs> 
Okay. Usually, we're not the expert either. So we have an expert <laughs> better than me. So we'll have a little inter intercession between each slide. I wonder if you can um, hit escape. I I'm gonna try. From current slide, I'm just gonna try again. Does that work? Uh -huh. How does it look on your? Okay. So let's see if I can move it. There we go. <laughs> All right. Who is Zerzus? She's, she's got the nose going. Okay. On. Are they? You're seeing on your screen right now is what the. No, oh. we don't have the, the we don't have the presentation on Zoom, so we need to reshare. Yes. Reshare. Well, that part you'll have to help me with because resharing on Zoom is not my forte. Mm -hmm. I've, do you know how to do that? Yeah. I don't want to go out. I just want to shrink. So, really, Xerxes Society. Um, some of you have probably heard of Xerxes Society, but I will kind of give you the quick uh, five second explanation of who Xerxes Society is. I happen to be a volunteer ambassador, along with Carol Elkins here in the front row, uh, and <laughs> and we're uh, representing this mission to uh, conserve invertebrates. Uh, they ba basically were named after the blue butterfly that was called the Xerxes blue butterfly that was the first butterfly that went extinct due to human causes. And this was back in 1943 that that happened. Um, we're an international insect invertebrate conservation organization. And we've got about 17,000 members. <laughs> Are we getting there? Is it sharing? <laughs> Carl. <laughs> Where's Carl? We got, <laughs> we got too many. We got two. So usually if you just hit Cuss um, from the current slide. Yeah, but I can't get it to or share. from the beginning. I but, can't get uh, the, the but zoom. that's on the Zoom. We're trying to get to the Zoom. Mm -hmm. I'm going to end the slideshow. Mm -hmm. Try and get back because you're not showing up in Zoom. Mm -hmm. Hey. <laughs> but do you know what the password is? Give it. <laughs> Never mind. I'm just going to go back here. I can I get the test. Wait, no, hold on. Thank you for being good sports about this. <laughs> they always are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've only I've done a couple Zoom talks before, but I'm usually sitting at home doing them. Yeah, sitting at home is much easier. Much much easier. <laughs> yeah, I got kicked off. Yeah, but she. Oh, you got kicked off too? Yeah. Okay, I should be coming through. If you would all turn off the Wi Fi's on your phone, that might help a little bit too. Because <laughs> we're all sharing the same Wi Fi. Is your Wi Fi on? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then hit from current slide. There you go. But we don't want notes 
necessarily. No. We're not, we're not seeing them. It's okay. No, okay. you guys are. The, the people on Zoom are. That's better. Okay. There we go. Can I move this out of the way? Oh, shrink that down. I am trying. <laughs> the, the, the neg there you go. Negative one. All right. Okay. So back to our mission. Our mission at Circe's <laughs> is to protect the life that sustains us. And so we do this through conservation and restoration work, which uh, is exciting, always exciting. That's kind of one of my personal favorites. Uh, advocacy work that's super important, uh, representing some of the more rare species out there that need representation. Uh, we work in research as well and education. And that's, of course, what we're doing here tonight. Oh, it worked, that's so exciting. So yeah, so a membership of over 17,000 people uh, in 15 plus countries, found countless foundations, scientists, federal, state, and local agencies, land managers, farmers, uh, businesses, and people that we work in partnership with, um, and certainly exciting to be a part of the mission. So really, why cherish bees? Uh, I think I'm kind of preaching to the, the, the choir with this crowd, uh, and you probably already kind of know that they're super special. But I came to cherish bees uh, basically when my kids were really young and catch, they would practice catch and release with these um, little vials that they would have on our little rose bush in the front yard. And <laughs> Michael can attest to this. And it just drew me really into their world, just through the eyes of a child, really. And uh, basically tried to start getting better at taking pictures of them because, as you know, they're moving targets. It's hard to get a good picture of a moving target. But as my photography improved, uh, I started to realize there's more than just one type of bumblebee, you know? <laughs> there's, there's, you know, in Illinois, we have 10 plus, uh, you know, that you can still potentially get to know in your own backyard, really. And if, if, you, if you do plant for them. So um, I, they just kind of work their way into my heart and I just adore them. What types are they? The, this would be a yellow bumblebee, if you can see that. This one here, Bombus vervitus, and this one is a bimaculatus, which is, Bombus bimaculatus, which is, I, I actually go for that Latin word, but this is the two-spotted bumblebee. And so, so really, what, why else should we care about our bee friends? Of course, it's because of plant reproduction. They're responsible for 85% of the flowering plants uh, that require pollin a pollinator to be able to reproduce. So it's this wonderful intimate partnership that they've um, co-evolved with these plants over millennia. And um, they're really a super essential to ecosystem function. And of course we all enjoy eating. Uh, I've been enjoying my beet salad here uh, with apples on it. And um, it's all brought to me by our pollinator friends. And this is an often quoted uh, statistic, but one out of every three of uh, our, our bites, our mouthfuls, uh, we can thank a pollinator for. And of course it represents this huge uh, economic force uh, of, of $30 billion uh, in value for the crops that um, just out of North America alone. And so at Whole Foods, they looked at what a typical uh, produce section might look like if we didn't have pollinators pollinating those optics, and this is kind of what it ended up looking like. And it certainly gives you pause when you realize how just bland life would be without um, our pollinators. And really, of course, it also impacts uh, the dairy section. You might not necessarily think that right away, but of course our cows have to eat alfalfa, which is pollinated by our pollinator friends. So this is what the dairy aisle would look like uh, if, if not for pollinators. And so we're also super thankful because they provide uh, seeds and uh, fruit for our wildlife. And so on the left, you'll see my um, backyard on the Joe Pye weed, a little goldfinch enjoying some um, Joe Pye seeds. And um, they're really at the center of a complex uh, food chain. And 
on up through on up through the chain from our chipmunks to the things that eat the chipmunks and sometimes they end up being food themselves like as in the case on the on the right and they really <laughs> enrich our lives if you think of all the different seasons that revolve around things that we enjoy doing that we can thank pollinators for berry picking halloween traditions even the super bowl guacamole we all like to enjoy <laughs> but i i'm going to add into this that it's the recreational value of, of just taking me into places like this, which is the Goose Pond. It's the um, Turner Tract at the Hackmatack National Wildlife Refuge this spring when I saw a whole carpet of blooming Dutchman breeches, which just were phenomenal just to behold this and just the mental and the physical benefits of bringing me into these environments. And, and I've gotten kind of caught up in the community science aspect of things too so i would say just all the just sense of purpose that comes from getting plugged in with um, these things going on um, at uh, in the community it's certainly beneficial so our main group of pollinators um, are right here you've got our butterflies of course um, that's a beggar moth in the middle flies beetles wasps, and of course our bee friends. And bees tend to really stand out from all of the other pollinators because they're just so good at what they do. They're just designed uh, to gather up pollen and disperse it across the landscape because of their um, tendency to exhibit something called flower constancy. Uh, they're very committed, very faithful to one flower and will move you know, to potentially hundreds of that same, just spreading pollen along the way. So this is just a little quick glimpse of what they're, you know, what some of our solitary bees are doing. Like I've kind of, you know, have a, a little soft spot in my heart for our bumblebees, but they're not solitary, they're social bee. 90% um, of the bees that we, uh, of the native bees that are out there are uh, live a solitary kind of single mom lifestyle. And so when they're collecting their uh, pollen, they will often, really the majority are, are doing tunnel nesting, but I'm gonna talk a little more about these things later. But they're taking the pollen they collect, um, creating little bee bread by mixing nectar and the pollen together. Um, and over the course of almost a, a full year, uh, they'll pupate and then over winter, and emerge again a year later. Uh, but one thing's for sure, bees are just hugely diverse. I've just got such mad respect for uh, just the creativity involved and all the different shapes and sizes that they come in. Um, there's 20,000 species worldwide, uh, you know, over 5,000 in North America and 3,600 in Canada and the US. And you can kind of just see, you know, from a morphological standpoint, just all the different ways they they look just um, on this particular side. And even just the range from small to large, the smallest Perdida uh, bee could fit in a lowercase o compared to some of these very large carpenter bees or bumblebees that you see. Um, and if you look at like our social bees, are, which, you know, the, the kind of this yellow piece on the, slot, on the pie chart here, that represents kind of our bumblebees and honeybees. And you just see what a colorful array, all these different, you know, subgenre of uh, various bees that exist. So um, we've got 90%, like I said, that are solitary lifestyle, not in the social category. 70% are making their nests in the ground, 30% in, in tunnel nesting. And they really just have a, a reputation for being gentle and non-aggressive if, if they're not provoked. And so I just thought I'd give a kind of little glimpse. I kind of gathered up some of my better photos of native bees that I've taken here in Illinois, just to kind of give a little look at um, the different ways that they can present. So like our first picture on the top left is, it's, it's kind of fuzzy there. It's not the best picture. It's a leaf cutter bee, and they have pollen brush underneath their abdomen um, that they, you know, collect that way. 
whereas our friend, this Drury's longhorn bee, has pollen brush or scopa, uh, scopal hairs more on her back legs that she piles up the pollen with. Um, this bee, uh, the, the leaf cutters tend to be more tunnel nesting while our little friend Cleides on the end here, this was in my backyard, loves like a nice sandy soil and just so precious with their heart-shaped faces. I, I, I adore them. <laughs> I really do. I'm just so in love with these bees. Uh, and then this, this, this special couple here, uh, they, they are a kleptoparasitic bee. They don't even collect pollen because they go in other bees' nests and lay their eggs. And then those, uh, those bees feed the larva and so they, they don't have necessarily pollen collecting structures that you'll see on them, but just such an array, a nice array of different ways that if you really start paying attention and tuning in, it's just super exciting and thrilling to start actually getting good pictures of moving targets and uh, figuring out what their names are. <laughs> so honeybees, it, this is a good time to kind of mention a lot of people do kind of when they think of a bee, they, their mind goes there to honeybees, but they're really not a typical bee. They're, they're the only bee that can actually die after they sting. All of our other native bees um, can sting over and over again. That's just fun fact. But they, <laughs> they, they, they do, <laughs> um, honeybees have perennial colonies where they theoretically could live over, you know, year to year to year. Whereas our bumblebees and other solitary bees have more of an annual cycle and you look at the just the sheer volume of bees in a honeybee hive, it, it can get upwards of 50,000, whereas our bumblebee friends, you know, kind of max out in the 400 range. And of course, honeybees are just so good at what they do. They extract the resources from the whole environment around their hive to produce that honey and store it away. Whereas bumblebees, they just take what they immediately need. You know, they don't hoard necessarily. <laughs> Um, but I, I kind of, that's endearing to me. I don't know why. I just, I love that. <laughs> uh, you know, our bumblebees, they're twice as heavy as, you know, these other bees, as, as a honeybee. They use twice as much energy. So as they need twice as much resources, uh, but they do it twice as fast. <laughs> so that kind of makes up for that deficiency. And so it's also worth mentioning our our honeybee friends are not endangered. And I know a lot of people kind of get that impression, but they, they really are not endangered. At this time on earth, on the globe, there's more honeybees than at ever any other time in history, um, according to a Xerces publication I was reading. And just to give you some perspective, in Illinois, there's 25 to 30 native bees that are on a list being debated about being listed for endangered or threatened status. So that gives you some pause when you realize, uh, you know, that's, you know, they're on their way potentially out. So another thing I like to kind of uh, mention about bumblebees that's super cool is they do this thing called buzz pollination and some of our other native bee counterparts do it as well. And it's a type of thing that 9% of the flowers in, uh, in the world need this kind of pollination. And it requires this special kind of buzzing and you know vibrating their wing muscles to extract the pollen out of these flowers that honeybees just can't do. Sorry. And so we really need to, if, if you enjoy prairie smoke and shooting stars, if you've ever seen them and been lucky to happen upon some in the spring, if you love your tomatoes, you know, bumblebees are able to, to pollinate that, whereas some of our other our honeybee counterparts cannot. So just something fun fact. Uh, so if we kind of keep zooming in on our bee diversity and look more, um, you know, in Illinois specifically, we have four to 500 or so bumblebees in Northern Illinois, maybe 250. And in a single garden, it's entirely possible you could get between five and maybe 30 if you're really, you know, out there encouraging them, giving them a good, you know, buffet. Um, so I would say that bumble, bumbling is humbling, you know, like when you go down this track of bumblebee and bee identification, just, start, it just starts with getting a decent picture. 
So I think we'd all kind of sweat a little if we had to get through a CAPTCHA test like this. So, so like if you had to guess, anybody want to just be brave and just guess how many of these are bees versus wannabes? Any any quick guesses? They're all bees. <laughs> no. no. Four. Four. Four is a good guess. Like actually, six. There's six D's on there. <laughs> Uh, this nomada is, it, it kind of has wasp-like qualities. It's its also one of those cuckoo bees. This one happens to be Lephyra thoracica. It's a robber fly who's, who eats bees and sucks their, you know. So it's eating a bee, <laughs> feasting on a bee. And so that's a kind of a trick question. But this this one here, this, this kind of gives our bee friends a bad rap, I think, coming, you know, this time of year. They make a lot of appearances starting to kind of seek out your food at your barbecues and things like that. And people will often confuse that with bees, but it's actually a yellow jacket or wasp. What's one of the oh. oh, this this is it's it's one of those bumblebee imitators. It want, it want, I call it a wannabe. It is it, <laughs> it's one of those uh, robber flies, very similar to this one, but maybe a different variety. That one was up in it is they these mimics they they, they, they that like, one fooled are the us are the wannabes good pollinators or not as good as the bees? they're really going after other insects to eat but uh that's actually a good question as far as do they pollinate the, but they are flies they're technically a fly yeah so you know I, this is kind of a little uh glimpse of some of the bumblebees we have in our in the chicagoland region the ones on the top tend to be a little more of the common species like our common eastern bumblebee on the left. I love that it kind of gives you a really good snapshot of quality forage, these plants that they find attractive. Uh, native thistle, our, our, our brown belted bumblebee next to, this, well this one here, I don't know. Uh, native thistle is highly underrated. People need to appreciate that more and find places for it in the landscape if you can. Uh, and then our, this is our two-spotted bumblebee in the spring, in the queen, a queen visiting some Dutchman's breeches, uh, Bombus orcomus, or a, a black and gold bumblebee on a super, super attractive plant for them, bee balm, Minarda. Down on the bottom, these are a little less common. You know, I would say um, our friend, the yellow bumblebee on the le bottom left is in the threatened category uh, of bumblebees, but certainly kind of one of my favorites. They're just so gorgeous when you see them. And the red belted bumblebee, they, they tend to have a shorter tongue. So you'll often see them on lower corolla type flowers like that, like the gray headed cone flower. Um, this was my first American bumblebee that I saw this summer doing uh, some bumblebee surveys that I did for the district. And uh, the, we, a bumblebee world, you know, they actually have a cuckoo version of a bumblebee as well that usurps the nest of others and ends up um, taking over the nest and making the workers do all their bidding. So that's what that one is on the bottom right is a, a lemon, a lemon cuckoo. And we have the endangered rusty patch bumblebee that still could be found in our region. This is like a little snapshot of the uh, some of the observations that occurred on iNaturalist this year when I snapped the picture there, but they've experienced like a really dramatic decline, like upward approaching 90% from what their historical range was. Uh, and really in a short period of time, like really 20 years, and we're down from 29 states to just a handful, but we're fortunate enough that we still have them in our region and it's a real opportunity for us to rally around that and do things to make life better for them and keep them around. So this was the first one that I observed and my husband is always proud to say he saw it first <laughs> and he did. And I took it with a cell phone, you know, it, it was kind of the beginning for me of becoming an advocate for native bees and um, just, just that moment. I was, I, I mean, it was a goosebump kind of inducing moment where for me, I had been looking, 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 we've been really trying hard. It took a while because it is a rare bee and finally found it. And it, it really made me pivot from just 
recreationally doing doing this to, to doing it with a purpose. So this is the depressing part where we're gonna kind of, you know, I think we got a late start. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll run through this a little faster, but this is the depressing part because I wanna get to the solution part. Uh, but we, you know, it's important to know why these declines are happening. And uh, of course, pesticides are a big, uh, you know, big implicator, habitat loss and degradation climate change and competi competition and disease have all factored into the declines of bumblebees and other, other native bees. Um, it's really a death by a, a thousand cuts so that, that I've heard Carol say in her talks. <laughs> and um, this kind of gives you a little snapshot of just in a short period of time, how much um, imidacloprid use has been used in agriculture. And it's really just quite significant seems to kind of coincide with a lot of our declines that we, we saw in, in bees, but you can't just pin it on agriculture, but certainly it's part of the problem, you know, part of the problem is this is impacting our bee communities. Uh, it's a neonicotinoid and it's taken up in the roots of plants, expressed in the material of the plant. And over time, bees are exposed to sublethal doses. It may not kill them right off, but it can just make them slower or just more, you know, just not as effective at doing what they do. Uh, it's super toxic and it's known to kind of really stay in the woody tissues, like once it's sucked up in shrubs and trees and, and what have you, or plants, um, it, it can remain in the material, in, in that material for a lengthy period of time. So it's not just our bees impacted, this is gonna illustrate kind of how our invertebrates are impacted. This is a mayfly hatch along the Mississippi River that's registered on a weather ra radar, um, an annual kind of event that is pretty significant if you think of the biomass involved um, when this happens. And some researchers found uh, just between 2012 and 2019, a 50% reduction in that hatch. And it's significant enough that it kind of really gives you pause. If you can Im imagine all of the layers of the food chain impacted from the fisheries to the um, birds and what have you. But we can't just blame agriculture for the problems. Uh, we have to take personal responsibility with the home and garden use that we, um, you know, when we're reaching in the big box stores for uh, pesticides, it's certainly, uh, kind of comparable to the amount of damage potential that, that the ag, right, right, it's pretty remarkable. So Xerces is recommending just to avoid using pesticides entirely, you know, if just do, just do what you can to just say no to using pesticides. But if you must, you really got to look closely at the label, um, read the guideline, you know, as quickly as you, you carefully as you can, but just really know that even when you're following all that tiny little fine print that you got to get the big, you know, uh, magnifying glass out to read. Um, but when you, once you've read it all and you're following all the rules, this can still happen. You can still end up with dead bees in jars. This was uh, 50,000 bumblebees that died after an incident that occurred in Portland. Well, no, Wilsonville, um, Oregon, where the trees were, they followed the label, they sprayed the trees. Um, but it still ended up seeping into the sap. Bumblebees drank from the sap, and over the course of two weeks, 50,000 of them ended up dying. And so that's even following the label the way it was described. Um, so really just knowing before you grow uh, plants treated at the nursery with systemic insecticides, such as neonicotinoids, will carry them with them. And Xerces actually did a little study where they looked at the plants, oh, milkweed in particular, being sold at some plant nurseries. And I think it was a significant amount. I'm trying to remember the number. Oh, Carol, help me. Ah! Oh, it was some crazy number, like 12. They, 12 was the average, and it was somewhere between like two and 26. So yeah, that, 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 you know, they're promoting these native plants and selling them to you, and you're taking your 
milkweed home, but it, it still had upward, on average, 12 pesticides on those native plants. So really know before you grow, ask your nursery how they plan for these kind of things. Source your plant material in good places where you know it's not going to have that on it. Um, habitat loss is pretty self-explanatory. I know I'm getting a little wordy, so I'm going to move through that part. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and of course, you know, we have to, our Americans have a love affair with our lawns. And so certainly just shrinking that down, this is habitat loss. You know, it's, it's a monoculture uh, that is, is not really serving our ecosystems in any way at all. Or, um, so shrinking that down is going to benefit all. Climate change, you can say bees are affected dramatically by these shifts, dramatic shifts in and heat, bumblebees in particular, they can cool, they're able to heat, heat up. They're, they're much more capable of um, using those same flight muscles to warm themselves up. They'll even warm the, the brood, like a chicken would brood on eggs, you know, to warm the egg when it's cooler. But they're less equipped to handle extreme shifts in heat and, and what have you. So climate change definitely, and a warming climate is impacting our bees. So um, it's also kind of important to notice that, or, or worth mentioning that beekeeping does not equal bee conservation. Many people uh, adopt the practice of honey beekeeping thinking it's actually being um, helpful. And so I would just point people who are wrestling or kind of curious to know more about this topic to a, uh, a publication that Xerxes has just put out called Why Getting a Hive Won't Save the Bees. And it really will help kind of spell it out for you why it's not necessarily helping our bees. There's certainly disease and uh, competition that factors in when we have uh, increased uh, hive densities in areas where we have already depleted resources and, and, and what have you. So bee conservation is not uh, the equivalent of honeybee keeping. So here's the solution. This, this is a good part. Uh, uh, some some action items that we can all kind of look to to potentially um, make life better for our our bees. And so, what do bees need? They need uh, flower-rich habitat, places to nest and overwinter, a pesticide-free environment, and of course, decrease competition, uh, increase the habitat. Uh, I really appreciate uh, my friend Pat's yard here. This is early in the season, just Virginia bluebells all over. It's not a surprise I've spotted uh, Rusty Patch and other rare bees in her yard. And the same thing happened at this yard this summer. This Every garden matters. This is uh, my friend Susan's yard, and she wanted to kind of know after a few years of installing native plants and uh, you know, kind of who's showing up in her yard. And so I came over there and, and lo and behold, uh, we found some Rusties in her yard. And, and so she's very intentionally, she calls it Pearl. Uh, let's see, pocket environments animals really like. So it's like a little Pearl in the neighborhood and we need more Pearls so that we form a chain uh, con a corridors, and she's not far from Hackmatack Wildlife, uh, the, the National Wildlife Refuge. So, really, these natural areas. Uh, well, I'll get to that later. <laughs> and really, this was my own little cherished moment that sparks joy for me when we had Rusties in my own yard uh, a few years ago. It's been a while since they've returned, but this was one that showed up on our hyssop and. Uh, any, even just little steps, little steps can make a difference. And so our natural areas, um, these are opportunities to learn and connect. Um, it's really the glue that holds everything together. It's where I find inspiration anytime I'm out in these natural areas. Uh, I appreciate uh, just being plugged in with the, our local conservation district and being given the opportunity to go through little training like we were talking about with chainsaw wielding and, uh, you know, jumping through the hoops for the herbicide thing. And, and, you know, just all of everything they've invested in helping me 
along and growing and understanding how to care for larger tracts of land. And, and just to really see the results, it's been really cool. And to see 11 year olds up to 77 year olds working together, it's to me, that's just super inspiring. And uh, yeah, it goes without saying when you see the landscape starting to transform from what it, the degraded form and try to you know heal it and bring it back into good health. It's super rewarding. But our unnatural areas are also opportunities in our neighborhoods for uh, improving, you know, creating little corridors or pearls like that piece together with other um, habitats in our neighborhoods from the um, roadsides to eco roofs to bioswales to power line areas to schools, libraries, uh, even our own homes, they're all little important pieces of of the puzzle. And of course, native plants are the best. Um, we want to provide flowers through the entire growing season from the early spring on to the fall when our asters and goldenrods are blooming. Um, really the spring and the fall are hugely critical uh, based on the life cycle of our, our bumblebees in particular, but all, all our bees. So early spring blooms that are vital for emergent queens. Super attractive plants are Dutchman's breeches, Virginia bluebells, water leaf, Virginia water leaf. I noticed so many on fruit trees this season. Um, at, I, I really like to kind of give a little plug for Xerces. Um, if you become a member through Xerces, we have a publication we send out twice a year called Wings. And in it, there was this wonderful article that um, Cass Mead just uh, shared about her research uh, on forest bees. And, and it's kind of interesting to me to note that um, when she looked at the bees and what they were eating, you'd be surprised. You think of oak trees as being wind pollinated. They're not really needing insect pollinators necessarily. Well, tw uh, 25, she found by looking in the bees what they had been eating, 25% to 100% of them had tree pollen in their in their guts. So tree pollen is hugely important, apparently. And who knew? But if you become a member, you end up getting um, this Wings publication twice a year, which is pretty cool. So there's super, all kinds of great resources out there uh, that can give you some insight into uh, plant choices or tree choices or shrub choices. I've got some material up there for people if they want to take a closer look. Uh, Heather Holm, has just an amazing amount of great resources on her website. If you've ever checked her out, I highly recommend it. But Xerces also has uh, great, great resources um, to tap. Uh, the NWF um, website has really helpful lists that give you some idea of which host plants are like keystone plants, ones that actually can benefit our butterflies and our bees in great ways. And pollen is certainly something that is highly sought after and a very vitally important uh, thing for many of our, our native bees. So going to the Keystone Plants by Ecoregion on the NWF website, this gives you a good, good idea of host plants that are super attractive for pollen specialist bees. Um, but you're really just trying to pick plants that have a whole, you, you know, you just a whole variety of different colors, uh, bloom periods, sticking with native species, especially based on our climate, you know, drought tolerance is important. Um, really trying to fill in the blooming gaps in your neighborhood of what thing, things you see other people doing. And I think we've all kind of heard this about leaving the leaves and it's something even in the last few years, I've gotten more um, fired up about doing myself. And if anything can encourage you to do it, it would be this. This is a rusty patch queen this spring that our friend Judy Carden up north, she's up in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and she's super involved in the Wisconsin Bumblebee Brigade. Um, but this was a, a queen that just emerged freshly from her uh, leaf litter that was in her yard um, in April, yes. <laughs> so really just, you know, as much as you can leaving a thin layer of leaf, leaves, um, spreading them on, like I'll, I'll put them on my uh, beds around the area as well. Um, 
it's, it's just avoiding shredding them. I know we mulch them in the past, but I've gotten more in the habit of just trying to push them into other places. And it, it's just little steps, you know, be, modifying your behavior. Our bumblebees need these untidy areas anywhere that a rodent or chipmunk or a mouse would find attractive south facing slopes. Um, they really are messy nesters. So they need these bunches of, if you, if you can leave bunches of grass, dried grass at the base, they probably find that very attractive. Um, just being mindful of those places to nest. Our native bees, 75, 70 percent mm -hmm. of them ground nesting. This is kind of what a typical um, nest tunnel might look like. Some might be shallow or some might actually be very deep, you know, two feet down into the ground and elaborate. Um, but my, my little Kalidi's friend, <laughs> there she is. This, this is really what my yard looked like that one here, just like a little aggregation of, of that species. It's the unequal cellophane bee. Uh, but they, they'll make these little um, partitions. And, and in, in the case of a Kalidi's bee, it's, it's like a resin-like material, almost plastic-like material. They'll partition it with other bees will use different materials, but that's just their kind of way of doing it, but they do need access to soil and our sandy soil in my backyard is, is very attractive for them. So uh, snags, dead trees, bare ground, going easy on the mulch and, you know, leaving some hollow stems for our tunnel nesting bees. And this kind of just is a good illustration of what that looks like. Um, I have these handouts here uh, that describe how to create habitat for stem nesting bees back there. Um, really what you're doing is um, not necessarily cutting everything back right away every season or at the end of the, you know, in the fall, leave it through the winter, cut it back in the spring, eight, eight to 24 inches. Um, and then certain types of plants, like this was New England Aster, I believe, um, but uh, other things like brambles, uh, Joe pie weed, piss up. <laughs> they they have nice and hollow stems, right? Um, and then you just leave them there for them to make their little babies. <laughs> and they also need nest materials. Um, really, really sweet to see leaf cutter bees doing this. I I have yet to get a decent picture like that, but um, you can go to a project on iNaturalist and. It's basically mega Kylie leaf cuts. And I'm, I just geek out about that stuff. And then you can kind of see what type of plant they were making their little circle cuts. Cause they're using these little circles that they cut out of the leaves of um, various plants. Red and buds. and the, exactly red buds. I, did, I put a red bud in just cause of, for that reason. And it's kind of blocked under here but basically they're using that to create a little section. Can you get rid of it? <laughs> but all it all it is is just kind of showing, yeah, showing a little more clearly how they use those segments to partition each cell that they'll then put their little bee bread with the little egg in. Super sweet. Oh no, now I can't advance. <laughs> I'm close to the end. <laughs> Um, Try it now. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, if anybody has questions in the meantime, this would be a good chance to answer them. I'm going to go back to the pesticide comment that I made where I put them Yeah. It was between 2 and 26. That's and right. tested over 200 plants. That's right. That's right. Yeah. can't hear. I think Say it again, yeah. When we were talking about pesticides, it was a, a test sample of 265, like 236. 36, something. But but the average was 12 pesticides on a plant. The, the range was two pesticides to 26, but the average, you know, was 12. Different types of pesticides oh, found. Okay, it worked? I don't know why. <laughs> so, so... Other, other things you can do is just building rock piles in, in your yard, you know, just kind of getting creative with your hardscaping, incorporating bunch grasses around that. Certainly um, lots of wildlife value there. 
for various species of bees and just really imagining what's going on in your neighborhood. Do, do kind of an assessment. Look at what your neighbors are doing. Uh, what's going on at the school, uh, the local businesses. Um, you might find, oh, this person's, they've got, you know, they've got a lot of uh, pines and, you know, just really filling in the gaps after looking around and imagining kind of a bee's eye view. A lot of our native bees don't go more than a couple hundred yards from a radius of where they were born. And so uh, really just kind of thinking a little bit like a bee. <laughs> Um, our public institutions and schools or churches, they really add a lot of educational opportunity. I was really fortunate to kind of have a little window into this pollinator garden that was just put in at Landmark School in McHenry um, that Small Waters worked with the school on installing. WPBC. Th this one, this one is WPBC. Yes, I'm going to. But oh, oh, cool. So you were involved. OK, so you helped Making furnish the plants. Plant that is awesome because because uh, if you can't see but behind here th this one's going to be uh, it'll be my WPPC plug but you're you're in both I guess uh, but really I had the you know I spent the day there they they had the teachers coming out and teaching the kids and we were just really just trying to introduce them to the garden help them make observations answer questions that they had so so cool just to see how the kids approach this garden. Uh, it, I couldn't believe, I mean, there was a range of one that wants to be a future entomologist and was all, all about it. But then another that I, I'm there helping just feel comfortable touching the plant. She, she, she was nervous to just touch the plant. And so it's just any opportunity we can get kids engaging with plants and insects is going to be super beneficial. So hats off to the people that are a part of making those outdoor classrooms a reality. And this is a, a rusty patch that showed up after our church got a grant through WPPC. <laughs> and uh, that first year it went for the HISSEP, of course, that is super attractive. They love that stuff. Um, and we haven't had them show up since then. But that's why we need another grant. <laughs> Got to fill in some gaps, you know. <laughs> um, yes, I think we will. And so really just a little plug to kind of just take some lawn out, do something different with the lawn, change your mindset. I've started to relax my ways, much to maybe my neighbor's chagrin, but, I, you know, they're, they're very good about having their, you know, they, they, they I, I I don't begrudge people for, you know, we all have our preferences, but I I prefer to relax a little on the lawn fronts. And it's been cool to see who shows up. This is a cousin of the Rusty Patch. Um, this is a, my lawn up north. Oh, I, I see a question. Well, just, uh, some people are like concerned about the bees, a lot of bees being around where their kids are. Mm -hmm. Is that really legitimate or how do you answer, you know, to try to you know, that, that, that's the thing with that school, I got such a sense of a fear. And, and a lot of times that seems to be what my focus is just helping people along and getting over this fear that they have in their minds, you know, and a lot of that, I don't know, you know, where that comes from, but it just, um, there's really, to me, uh, you know, if you have an allergy, I can see why you'd be more guarded, like if you know you have a life-threatening allergy to bees. But I, I, I am in a pool of a bumblebee snow globe with some of these survey work that I do. They are I'm surrounded by them. I I I'm pushing my luck by saying it out loud, but I have yet to be stung, and I'm like in a sea of bumblebees and other bees, and I you just slowly learn how to recognize if they're getting agitated or concerned, and they do this very predictable behavior where they'll circle around kind of looking closer at you. And sometimes that's my opportunity to just back up slowly. And, you know, mostly it's just keeping a calm head and, and not moving fast and, you know, just to, just to stay calm. And that's probably a big challenge for, you know, some people that have a big fear. Don't you think 
the yellow jacket wasps give a bad reputation absolutely to all bees. absolutely so, uh, they are mean they want to hurt everybody <laughs> they are just they're, they're, just, just, they're, but just they're, but yeah august and september but i think i think i get a we we've, we've tabled I'm out in my garden all the time and the bees never bother me but yeah. yes i have been attacked by oh oh animals. sure they're certainly more aggressive and known for that and and definitely give bees in general a bad rap and so you know, a lot of times tabling events, a lot of our conversations are just trying to help people along in their understanding that they're not to be necessarily feared to kind of keep, you know, keep calm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was wondering about mason bee houses. You know, some people are really big on making these mason bee houses. Mm -hmm. Is that a good thing or? You know, I, I I can see the educational value with children for them to see something up close, you know, on a small scale. But I, I think it's just more fun to just make the observations in a natural setting because a lot of those aren't constructed well and they give a lot more opportunity for disease to be spread and for predators to get in there and just get them. Um, I prefer that, like that slide I had about the natural route of just creating natural stems, natural areas where that's going to happen, and you can make those observations anyways. Um, and oftentimes, I've heard with mason bees, there is an invasive version of them, and so if you you may have every good intention by putting them out to think that you're helping, you know, the species, but other bees show up in them, including the non-native variety of mason bees so it, it is that helping the the bee community in your neighborhood if if you're encouraging more invasive ones to reproduce not so much so i i, I prefer just to and i think xerxes would recommend maybe steering away from that and, and keeping things natural um so love the questions you guys when we're, we're near the end here uh, really just be proud of anything you're doing out there. Put a sign out um, to kind of let your neighbors know you're doing something intentional. That's a really attractive sign for... Um, to... Oh yeah, you can go to the website and get one. By all means, go for it. <laughs> uh, and, you know, take the pledge that you're going to grow pollinator-friendly plants, provide nest and egg-laying sites, avoid using pesticides, spread the word, and then you know, take that pledge. Um, I, I just like putting a final shout out for all the community science that goes on in our community. So many different ways to plug in for you to encourage students um, to, you know, get their cell phones out, take pictures of bumblebees, submit it to Bumblebee Watch. It, you know, that's kind of the way I, I got into this was through photography, the lens kind of into their little bee world, and then challenging, challenging myself to learn the names. But what was so cool was to realize that in doing that, the information I'm gathering is actually helping local uh, researchers or, and conservationists make decisions um, on restoration work that they're doing. If they're seeing the presence of certain species or the absence, it gives them good information. Um, so many different organizations uh, worth taking a closer look at. And in the case of Xerces, we just started an atlas for fireflies where we're looking at those species. Uh, there's also a monarch ne nectar plant database that, that we do. Um, Illinois has bee spotter. Um, I've bounced between bumblebee watch bee spotter, but now I've been helping out with the conservation district. iNaturalist, super, super, super cool. So good, like you're always, once you start looking at bees and getting a good picture of them, you're noticing all these others, you know, the the wannabes and the flies, the uh, wasps, and, and you're, you know, just keeping that healthy sense of curiosity. iNaturalist has been great in answering my questions and getting feedback on um, what it is I'm seeing. And, you know, considering plugging in with a master naturalist program, uh, that's a, a nice way to round out, you know, what you're learning. So, so many different um, wonderful opportunities out there, including the River Watch Network, which is blocked here, but I know Scott was in uh, the class that I took on that. And, you know, I can say after that little session, I fell in love with caddisflies, like <laughs> Hannah's holding out a little cat caddisfly in its little house. You know, it was so sweet. 
So really lots of uh, downloadable resources available on our website for, from Xerces. I I'd definitely take a look at that. Um, we're on all of the socials, great selection of um, webinars on, um, on YouTube. Donors make everything possible. And I'm ending with my daughter's picture here of, uh, she made this back in high school. I'm sure she could, yeah, yeah, but she, <laughs> I love what it communicates. I, I just love the heart that she created this, you know, uh, and it, it's really kind of a picture I'd like to imagine for the future where we kind of see ourselves in uh, a partnership, in a relationship with this, with these um, creatures, that there's a mutuality there, you know, that there's um, joy, there's care, concern, you know, and when you have those kind of relationships with something you want to protect it you want to you want you you want it to have a decent future and so that's how i'm going to end this <laughs> so yeah <laughs> yeah any more questions oh. oh, okay sure um so going back to pesticides i think i hear a lot of like the safer pesticides or the organic pesticides as being the options. I'm someone who will fight someone like, oh, just use neem oil, it'll be fine. Um, did you have any comment about, mm. uh, like, if we want to stick to no pesticides, how, how damaging can some of these safer or organic pesticides That's a, be? To really yeah, she, she's asking about, um, you know, organic or alleged safer pesticides that are promoted, um, you know, in some circles. And I'm still learning a lot about that. I know Carol could answer this better than me. Uh, you know, I, I think Xerxes would really still fall back on, you know, a conservative approach on that. Um, we don't know, uh, you know, we don't, we don't have all the answers on some of these new organic products that are safe or allegedly so if they've been tested and tried and true and all of that. So I think there's um, natural ways of approaching, um, it, you know, there's a slide I kept out of the presentation about our natural beneficial insects that like ladybugs that come along and eat aphids. So a lot of people might have a uh, impression they should spray to get rid of the aphids and, and really just kind of letting nature um, do its thing naturally in your yard. Like from, from our standpoint, in our, um, you know, little circle, suburban circles, I, gu I guess you could say, uh, really there's, there's no reason for us to be reaching for pesticides, you know, like you can have, attract hummingbirds to your yard or bats to eat, eat the mosquitoes. And I, I don't know. Working, working in a little bit larger scale. <laughs> okay, she is, okay. I, to, for reference, I own a completely pesticide free yep. farm. Oh, wonderful. Um, and I, on a smaller scale, I hear people say, oh, well, I just use neem oil, so it's fine. Okay. I'm like, I'll, yeah, I'm going to come close to Carol so you can hear through my microphone her response. So I, I'm not an expert on pesticides either, but I'll just add that Xerxes has said that neem oil is actually a systemic insecticide. So I okay. think it's safer, but it's actually showing up as a systemic. Yeah. Can okay. I add just a little bit. My son is an agricultural entomologist at the University of Florida. Oh, okay. And he is doing a lot of research. And what he tells me is the one safe thing is essential oils and yellow sticky traps. Oh, yeah. and they are doing a lot of research hmm. with those two products okay. and trying to find ways they can do it on a larger scale, actually, because they're trying to feed the world, mm -hmm. you know, they're mm -hmm. trying to find ways to feed the world, but, right. you know, but right That's now the two safe things are essential oils, essential and yellow, oils, yellow right. stri sticky traps. Yeah. I, 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 and fine <laughs> mesh netting are my two favorite things. Fine so, mesh netting. Right. Right. Because they have traps for the outdoors yeah. in our yards. That's mm -hmm. a bad idea. And right. With birds and your sticky so oh, right. Among other creatures that would end up there. Yeah. For a large scale agriculture, that certainly sounds logical. But smaller scale, like our backyards, not, not as applicable. But any other questions, you guys? Oh. One of the effects of climate change is plants are blooming earlier than mm -hmm. the trees are coming up every year. 
anything being done to, to try and mm -hmm. you know find bees that are or insects that are pollinators that that catch earlier you can try and I know like they're doing coral if you're trying to get coral to find coral that are more heat resistant than the ocean mm -hmm. so anything with pollinators to try and get, so the question Earlier I'm repeating the question for people that may not have heard it. It's just uh, has to do with phenology and the bloom time and wondering if as things are changing, if there, if we need different pollinators to address that. I, I, I think my only, you know, I, I don't have all the answers because I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a volunteer, you know, no but, but yeah, yeah, that, that's not one I'm as familiar with, but I do know, um, you know, our bumblebees in particular are having a hard time adapting to climate change and um, they're, they're not necessarily moving their range where it would be better for them. They don't have the, they're not able to adapt as fast as you would hope. And that's certainly not gonna bode well for the pollinating that goes on uh, in the areas that they're not going to be able to get to. So I, I, I don't know how this is going to play out in the bee world, but I, I mean, I was just reading about even honeybees that are impacted by the extreme heat that they're experiencing. They don't want to go out when it's as hot as it's been and uh, aren't as effective at what they do or pollinating. Um, in fact, it can be very devastating for, for even our honeybee hives. Um, which are a managed species where you can bring it in and put it where you want it. And even then with extreme, extreme, uh, you know, that's gonna, they're not necessarily gonna perform to the level you might need them, you know, if, if they're challenged and stressed by heat. But, so. Well, thank okay. you very much. <laughs> My, thank you. And if you have any more questions, if you have any more questions, you can put them in the chat or did, we have any in the chat that we needed to deal with? Okay. All right. So time for any announcements you all might have. And uh, if so, 